Gary's running the presentation from the room where there's something that use my computer and if we go on to join, don't worry, we'll be on the same page eventually. But uh, uh, really do appreciate the invitation, the ability to speak with you this morning. Uh, the, the presentation, uh, customizing testing for your farm and ranch. But uh, really what I want to do today to start us off is really start, you know, asking some, some deeper questions, getting get that thought process going that Carrie talked about. Go to that first slide, Terry. So just a little bit more about myself. Uh, I'm actually uh, not, not a native Nebraska, born and raised in uh, uh, Wamego, Kansas. There's a, fam a family there. I actually got my uh, bachelor's and master's from K State, uh, going on uh, quite a few years ago now. And then came, came to Nebraska in 2010, uh, went to the University of Nebraska, uh, got a PhD in 2015, and, uh, but the, my journey at World Laboratory started during my undergraduate days. Uh, so first, first came to Nebraska for a summer in 2005, uh, and then firmly moved out to, to Kearney in 2014, and that's where we've been ever since. So a little bit about the uh, introduction for today. Uh, because this is kind of a little bit what I'm talking about and thinking about this uh, critically uh, today, this morning, you know, where we've come in the past decade. Uh, it all kind of started, you know, about 10, well, about 13, 14 years ago. There's a group that had uh, uh, called the Soul of Renaissance. They, they tried to get a group of uh, both academic and some private organizations together and, and to see what they could do differently in agriculture. Uh, through that, uh, the Soil Health Institute was formed. Uh, Soil Health Partnership kind of came out of it as well. We had this big push. Uh, NRCS came up, uh, they, they created their own division. And then in 15 and 16, there's a lot of government programs about trying to get people involved, get people to change their hearts and minds, uh, maybe uh, learn a new way. But, you know, there's a little bit of caution that I have with that. Is that uh, you know if you put up the chart of farm income during that same period, you know correlation is not causation by any means. But when you looked at farm income decreasing over the past decade, uh, the advent of programs coming to fruition were people looking for something else. Were they you know are we are we getting people involved for the right the right ways? So this is where I think it, it's, it becomes critical that we need to think about the progress that we've made to get people to kind of see a, a different way of doing it. But make sure that just because now uh, during the pandemic farm income skyrocket, that uh, we don't kind of abandon what they might have learned over the past uh, five to, to eight years or so. So if we go to the next slide, you will see that just those thoughts, you know, where, where some farmers looking for a magic pill, so to speak, uh, do we actually affect some sort of permanent mind, uh, mindset change or, or, or focus on what they should be doing? Uh, and what is the staying power then of, uh, of what we're doing with regenerative agriculture and soil health? You know, and, and in my mind, and I'm sure some of the vendors here, and maybe even your mind guess that that's the case, there, there really is should be some, some long-lasting effects, but uh, let's be cautious that, that we need to continue to talk about those things so we make sure to, to continue to bring everyone along with us. And then having plateaued on, on changing management practices as, as farm incomes uh, uh, spike, are people less willing to, to change or, or add try new things? So today, uh, today's kind of uh, presentation rundown here over the next 45 minutes or so. We'll just kind of talk about some practicality uh, based on environmental conditions. Uh, really what I want to do a lot is focus on profitability and uh, from, uh, based on fertilizer recommendation and fertilizer or nutrient management, if you will. Uh, some of the soil testing things that we do at that work that can help fit that, that goal. Uh, finally, the, the long-term idea of carbon, you know, that, uh, Moro here, Indio, some different carbon groups. Uh, talk about why that, that's so important. 
and then finally some concluding, concluding remarks. So just to go over, you know, next slide. Uh, just to review real quick, our, our, our five principles of soil health, you, can, you can't have a soil health event if you don't talk about those. But uh, we got, you know, armor the soil, minimize disturbance, uh, continual plant, diver or plant diversity, continual roots in the, in the soil, and livestock. Now, we gave this presentation last year in a, in a very arid environment of the Panhandle that was experiencing some pretty significant drought at the time. So when we throw up these five things, everyone in the room is just like, rolls their eyes. We've, we've heard this before, not, not, not here. And lo and behold, we moved the meeting to the east and the drought followed us. So once again, the, the audience is looking at these five things and, well, this is a great story, but not here. So if we go to the next slide, I think what, what really has to, to focus on, and, and I think sometimes is missed by other, other uh, presentations or speakers, is that you, you just got to talk about local application of these, uh, of these principles. So here's the, the latest drought monitor from end of last week, and you'll see that, yep, we're right here in that deep red in, in eastern Nebraska. So we know that Mother Nature really will tell us how to play those five principles. And I think that the key is, is that if we start with uh, minimizing disturbance, maintain residue, crop residue, minimizing disturbance, we can, we can really prevent unnecessary erosion, uh, both water and, and wind, and, I and then we can dabble in and mix in some of the other stuff as we go along. But the key is to protect the soil and to always remember that it's not always going to work perfectly every year. And you just got to roll with what Mother Nature provides for us. So on the next slide, as we talk about farm profitability, I know this is a, you know, the age-old question is agriculture a way of life for us in business. As we continue to evolve in our industry, uh, size of the farm operations get bigger, you know, this becomes a, a real, real question. So if, if do we want to be a lifestyle or just have small equipment running around, or are we going to be some sort of a big factory? I should say factory farm, but just be a big, big farm that focuses on uh, reducing labor as much as possible, getting things done as fast as possible, and, and treating it, treating it just like a, uh, any sort of a public, public trade kind of we're trying to squeeze out every nickel and, and nickel and dime. And I would contest, Ted, if you want to advance a few animations, that we need to have a mixture of both. Um, you, you, can't, you can't treat it as a, as a lifestyle, or you'll never uh, move ahead, you'll never make, it, make a difference with your, with your peers, because they all see you as treating as a lifestyle, so they'll immediately exclude anything you do from being relevant to them. Now, on the same side, those that uh, focus solely on, on turning, uh, turning acres, getting things done, become uh, uh, a, a, another light be on it. I don't want to be that guy. So you, you've got to find the balance. And I think the, the thing that I've been thinking about a lot, and, and uh, Del knows this, is that my adventure this past year and, and kind of purchases a farm ground working on it, but you almost got to start taking a, a day branching approach, if you will, to some of our input costs. As, as you get to talking about, uh, especially fertilized dollars for me, which I, I really focus on, but you know, there's always, well, this is just a few extra dollars an acre, well, this is just a, this is just so many dollars an acre, it's not even really that important. But when you start putting all those dollars together across a lot of acres, you can really find some money. So, what, what we want to talk about today on, on farm profitability from my perspective, it's uh, managing the fertilizer inputs. And by doing that, we want to focus on each element by itself. We don't want to group everything together. And then we want to go back to the basics on some of this nutrient availability. And as we look at changing our, our management practices, how do we change our management practices to really help each nutrient get, get to the plant better? And then, uh, do we need non, uh, put this in non-nutrient products? So like a, a fertilizer enhancer, a, a fertilizer safener, so 
more biological products? How do we decide if those are, are worthwhile or not? Next slide. So as we know, we uh, talking about how nutrients move to the plant. There's three main, main ways. Uh, root interception, where the roots just go right by where it is. Mass flow, so soil and water moving to the plant as the plant's taking up water. Uh, the, the nutrients are just in that soil solution coming to the roots. Or the fusion gradient. So, you know, I'm taking, the plant's taking in uh, phosphorus. Now there's a, a shortage. The soil is trying to balance itself so the nutrients won't shift over and move to those roots as well. And it moves that way. These are the, you know, a traditional aspect of what we think about a nutrient developing for plants. But if we think about now how we're going to change it, our, our management practices, how do we uh, how do we use these three principles and think about the way we change our management strategy to make sure that each one uh, is is enhanced. So next slide. Oh. Back now, I guess. So you know this is a uh, table. I had a percent of nutrients supplied by each mechanism. Now, so you'll see that yes, they're over 100 percent. But uh, the main thing here is that when you look at this table, we'll start with nitrogen. A lot of, as we know, nitrate and ammonium gets is moved into soil solution water to our roots. Uh, there's a little bit of diffusion there. Uh, phosphorus, a lot of it is diffu the diffusion gradient, very low root interception or mass flow. So now thinking about what we do from a soil health perspective. Uh, phosphorus is a great one to, to focus on. How do we, you know, we're worried 93% diffusion. So, well, it doesn't make any sense to try to make a gradient bigger to get phosphorus to our plants. So how do we increase, say, root interception? How do we increase root interception uh, in phosphorus uh, uptake? Well, we need a more robust root system, more roots in the soil. We need a way to enhance that root system, some sort of, you know, mycorrhizal fungi, a good Good relationship uh, with soil microbiology will increase the root area, increase the root length. That increases, increases our ability to have root interception of, uh, and, and accumulate more phosphorus in a, in a better way. And then of course, some of the other other elements, calcium, magnesium. You know, these are very abundant in the soil. So when you get water moving uh, to the plant, they have plenty of. They should always have plenty of calcium, plenty of magnesium, and, and to some extent, sulfur as long as there's enough. Heat kicked out uh, through organic matter oxidation or, or maybe through fertilizer application. There we go, next slide. So then it, we, we, we've got our methods of how to get the nutrients to the plant, and now if we go back and now review the, the mobility of these nutrients within the soil. So we want to think about immobile nutrients. Uh, they're more retained, they don't move, and once again, you can go back to that the table. If the nutrient's not moving via mass flow, essentially it, it's an immobile nutrient, it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, but those, those are mainly, you know, PK are our major, major uh, nutrients, but secondary is calcium, magnesium, but a lot of micronutrient metals are, are all immobile. Zinc, iron, magnesium, copper, nickel, and aluminum. But you know, mainly we always, at least in a lot of row crop production, we focus on PK and Z. So then we need to know that those are somewhat mobile, so then we can manage around that and, and plan our nutrient applications uh, in that manner. So this table, yeah, this table right here, you know, this is a, a general uh, structure when we talk about making fertilizer and nutrient recommendations. Uh, we have our soil test values on the x-axis and our yield response on the y. And traditionally we think that as we have a lower soil test, the, the ability to respond from a nutrient application becomes much higher. Now if this is a, a more traditional approach thought about in, uh, with different farming practices, and then some people will contest that, well, now that we farm differently, the, the soil tests are not, not accurate anymore. Well, if you change the way the nutrients are available to the plant, it's the same principles. You just need to shift uh, these vertical lines more to the, uh, to the right, or yeah, to your 
your to your right. Uh, so now you have to have a very, you know, maybe a even low soil test value. Uh, you'll barely get a response. Uh, excuse me, you'll shift you to the to the left of the screen. Yes. So you know, even at a low soil test value, your probably likelihood of a, of a fertilizer response becomes less. Now this chart is a little, little busy, but we'll, we'll step through it. And, and this illustrates from a recommendation standpoint. So, you know, a lot of people always talk about fertilizer recommendations, but I don't know how many talks I've seen in the past uh, five, six years uh, actually dive into some of the, the actual equations and, and why they're, they're writing in recommendations. And I think some of that is, is the lack of people uh, involved in, in uh, soil fertility at, at an extension level. Um, and, but, and sometimes the other part is this chart's not really fun to talk about, so then we skip over it. But it's, it's uh, a lot of, once again, on the x-axis we have a soil test, and then on the y is our relative yield. So as we move from a low soil test over here to a higher soil test, uh, rationally our, our, our uh, fertilizer rate would, uh, or fertilizer response would, uh, or, uh, so the relative yield increases as you have a, uh, have a higher soil test value, meaning we need to fertilize less. So as you can see, a, a lot of these uh, lines in here, and this is this is from K State, but you know, as you have that low soil test, you, you need to focus on multiple ways to supply the new, the crop of nutrient. Uh, nutrients to start a fertilizer, uh, some sort of a broadcast application. As you become at a higher soil test, you can reduce, you know, or the, the amount of nutrients you need to supply becomes less, so we can change our fertilizer practices. Maybe we just need a, a small starter rate just to kind of supplement to get things going, but we know the soil will supply plenty as the year goes on. And then we get to a range where there's no response and there's just no sense of putting fertilizer on unless you're in, in case we have uh, a, a larger livestock operation close by that we're looking to, to get rid of some manure and, and you can go ahead and apply from that perspective. But once again, sticking with this theme, uh, if we've changed our management strategies, we, we've improved the, our, our root structure, we know that we have better soil life, just because some of this work was done before a lot of these practices doesn't mean this is automatically wrong. All you've got to do is just slide the axis over to where now uh, the crop responsive range, instead of starting at 20 parts per million, maybe that, that crop responsive range starts at 15, maybe it starts at 12. You essentially just move everything down a little bit. Uh, it's just the same principles, it's the same, same soil, same nutrients, but you've got a little bit more help to get the nutrients there. So you just slide it over. You don't have to. You don't. You don't throw it out because you, you change. You change the way uh, you're farming. So I, I think that's the real critical one, especially as we get questions at, at the laboratory about doing different things or looking at things differently, and why you keep using or why you use the, the test you do. Uh, this is why we, we still did. This, this stuff isn't irrelevant. You just have to adjust it to today's conditions. Another big thing about profitability is soil pH and soil pH management. And this is one of the questions, you know, we're, we're more in the eastern part of the state, uh, not as much irrigation, so uh, pH and lime become a, a bigger question mark. So the big question is, you know, how do you change pH? But well, you, have, you have to use lime. You have to use calcium carbonate. So here we have uh, our soil test, or our soil particle. Over here, that's acidic. You can see it's dominated by hydrogen ions. Uh, we know that, that that reduces nutrient availability for some elements. That increases aluminum solubility, which is uh, damaging plant roots. It can reduce uh, certain microbial functions, or, or it becomes uh, uh, focuses your microbial population. So we want to maintain a pH in that six, seven to seven two range. So we add our calcium carbonate line. We replace the hydrogen ions, we pick that out, we make water and CO2 essentially. Next slide, Gary. 
we often get the we often get the question though the lab is well that line is just too expensive. Why can't I use jib? Why it's got calcium in it? And this is a bit, one of the biggest misnomers is that gypsum will actually increase soil uh, acidity because you do not have the carbonate attached to the calcium. You have to have the carbonate ion to, to be able to, in, to raise your pH back up. Now, one of the bigger things in the state of Nebraska is that those that have irrigation have the built-in line factory every year. So that's why you don't have to. Heart, if you think about hard water, has carbonate in it, so every time we're putting on an irrigation water, we're putting on a little, a little bit of lime rain. So for most of our irrigators in the state of Nebraska, uh, we don't have to worry about lime. But those pivot corners, uh, our dry land acres, uh, anytime we're putting on fertilizer, we're creating acidity, and that has to be corrected. And I think that that's the biggest biggest thing to profitability is that uh, lime, although it's a very, very expensive input, you should be able to use those expenses across multiple years because it is a uh, often a five, maybe on a short and five year uh, window, maybe a, up to nine years on the long range. So, but that, that the longer, uh, that line occupation will last longer with less fertilizer you put on. So once again, we talk about managing inputs. If we are diligent on our nitrogen management, we will reduce the amount of lime we need in the long term. If we are rotating crops and we don't just have corn, 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 we will mix in a crop that doesn't need nitrogen fertilizer, we'll lengthen out that line application yet again. So some of those other, other practices can stretch these and it make us more profitable in the long run as well. Next slide, Gary. So how, how can soil testing help? And uh, here's five different things on uh, how, what we do or why we do soil testing. We can direct fertilize their applications and that's what we've been talking to uh, so far. Uh, the, the second one is diagnosis problems. Uh, we, we often use this as a diagnostic tool, especially in, in years like this where we get some uh, pretty wild growth changes based on some uh, air conditioning. We wanna see what's going on. Uh, third, environmental compliance. Fourth, uh, and this has become increasingly more and more important is the sustainability and the benchmarking aspect of soil testing. And then finally, sometimes we're just curious to see why a certain soil does what it does every year. And in testing all these things, we kind of have three areas of focus. We can look at chemical properties of the soil. We can look at physical properties of soil, you know, structure, infiltration. And then it's always been kind of the, the third third spoke or the third third leg of the stool is soil biology. And as we've come along in the last decade, I'd say our ability to test biology, assess it, and kind of give you some sort of uh, recommendation, give you some sort of guidance on, on what we find has, has improved greatly. So very it's a very critical aspect. For a long time it's forgotten. We focus on chemical, we somewhat focus on physical, we started reducing tillage. Now that we've really gone to a, a very minimum to no till system, now that the biology is, is our, our piece that we can really start adding. Next slide, yeah. So here we have our, our soil health assessment test and what we're, we're doing a lot now. Uh, so for anyone who's interested uh, in, in a kind of holistic management or you know, wanting to, to really take an encompassing picture, uh, once again, we've taken uh, our three our three items, one more animation theory. We've taken our three our three areas of chemical, biological, and physical, and we've come up with what we, we have a lab test, we've always had the chemical side. You can see that highlighted in the, the uh, orange, it's kind of highlighted in the orange, orange box. So you know, traditional things, pH, organic matter, phosphorus, potassium, uh, calcium, uh, micronutrients, zinc, zinc, iron, magnesium, copper. Uh, we can assess those, we can make sure that we have uh, proper fertility uh, available for a crop. Uh, from a physical perspective, we like to do our, our modified aggregate stability test now. So what we're doing there is you think about uh, aggregate stability, we dip in soil, uh, and what we do differently in this one versus what you know, a researcher might do is that they're all, and more interested in wanting to know well, how much stain rate you have. Well, for all intents and purposes, if you have a, 
larger grain of sand, it's going to function quite like an aggregate mill. It's not going to disperse, it's not going to seal, it's going to allow water to infiltrate. So that's why we say it's modified. We include both aggregate size and grains of sand about, at about roughly the same size. So a great, great physical parameter to say, hey, we've got good structure, obviously. Uh, if we're holding our hands together, our infiltration should be better. On the next page, uh, not yet, but uh, you'll see on the next page we also do uh, base saturation and CC, another kind of, kind of chemical, but also kind of physical property that helps us assess. Do we have a, a fine texture soil? Do we have maybe a, a coarse texture? That's going to really affect the way we manage things. And then finally, the swing box. Oh, if, if we're back on the slide, the green box, we have all of our soil biology characteristics that we're currently putting in this test. Uh, the biggest one that uh, most of us know over the last, last 10 years or so is soil restoration. Uh, that 24 hour restoration test, we take some soil, we add some water, we incubate, let's see how much uh, CO2 is created. It comes out of that soil based on uh, the soil microbial population going to work. Uh, now it's got the recognition how, how alive is it or how, how uh, excited can it become. Coupled with that, we do our water extract of, of carbon and nitrogen. This kind of gives us an idea on some of these food sources that the uh, microbial population will be, look, be able to look at. And then we do some calculations with these numbers. Uh, CDM ratio, if we have a, you know, of course if we have a narrow CDM ratio, uh, eight to one or lower, we're, we're net, uh, we're, we're positive on the mineralization side, we're kicking out nitrogen, we gotta have something there to take it up. Otherwise, we're going to lose it, lose it to the environment. We're going to lose it. We get leaching. Uh, we're going to get oversaturated. We get uh, denitrified. Lose it that way. Uh, conversely, if we're if we're high, if we're above 12 to 1, uh, we have a net uh, tie-up situation. If you're a row crop farmer at that point, you've got to add fertilizer, uh, or I should say fertilizer. You've got to add some sort of nitrogen amendment to be able to supply that growing crop, so you you don't short the crop. Uh, Nitrogen, you're able to accomplish your yield, your yield objectives. Okay, now on this next page. Oh, we're still too far. Okay, but if you go back a page now, we've got uh, what I just talked about: the sun kind, base saturation, and of course our uh, our fertilizer recommendations, which different than a traditional soil test. In a traditional soil test for for world laboratories for many other labs, we've always used a uh, yield goal. Uh, times the nitrogen requirement minus nitrate, or and sometimes we'll minus an organic matter fraction, uh, or some sort of predicted organic matter available in. But what we'll do on the soil health assessment is we'll actually use yield goal, uh, nitrogen rec uh, requirement, come up with a number, now we can deduct total, or we can deduct nitrate. We've uh, analyzed the ammonia on the, on the uh, soil health assessment, so we got another, our two forms of mineral in. That we're taking off that recommendation. And then since we do have that CDM ratio, we calculate a little bit in release, what can we expect there? So now we've got three ways to deduct off that requirement. And then if you're able to submit a, uh, a subsoil sample, uh, just eight to 24 inches, it, it's, really, it's really helpful. If you can go deeper, that's great. But now we've got even now a fourth pool of end that we can start deducting from that recommendation. So we start really refining, dropping, dropping what we need what we, what we predict we're going to need from, uh, from a nitrogen fertility uh, perspective. And once again, I think this is where uh, this soil health assessment kind of stands by itself in, in, the, in the soil testing industry from, from a soil health perspective is that PK and all the micronutrients are all based on extracts at multiple universities across uh, both the High Plains, the Western Slope of Colorado, the I States have all to work with. So we know for a fact if we run a soil assessment, you get a zinc recommendation, there is very high confidence to say if you're getting a zinc recommendation, you, you definitely get it because you're in a responsive zone. And I think that's the, the, the big thing that Ray will push on, that he's always wanted to push on, is that uh, more laboratory recommendations, if you compare them to other labs in the state, are what some people would say very conservative. Ray will tell you they're right. But uh, so we, we recommend zinc, we recommend manganese and copper. We are we're, uh, very, very uh, 
sure of ourselves and saying, hey, this is something that you really need to look at and manage appropriately. And that confidence comes because we have these, uh, these nutrients, uh, nutrient extract solutions. Okay, now we'll go to the next slide. So, that we come to, if we go through the animation there, drop down to uh, item number four, uh, the sustainability and benchmarking. What, what are we going to test in, in that aspect? Go to the next slide. So we want to know, we want to know where we are. What, we want to know what, what our soil bank has, has inside of it. So what we've, what we've introduced here in the past, I would probably say eight years now, is our uh, soil nutrient digestion. So this is a, a ability to give us a, if you advance a couple, couple animations. So this, this test now, uh, we treat, treat it just like a, uh, say, a manure sample or a, a plant sample. We take the, take the soil, uh, digest it down, so we just have some mineral constituents uh, and, and quantify those, so we have a total pool. So uh, we start with, start with the major major ones we want to talk about. Carbon and nitrogen. What are our totals? How, you know, often, it's talked about is how much nitrogen is actually in our soil and, and how much carbon. So the 3,000, in this example here, this, this report, we have 3,000 uh, part per million nitrate in our soil, or excuse me, 3,000 part per million total in the soil. Why in the world are we need to provide fertilizer if we've got 3,000 parts out there? Well, it's, it's all a balance and it's likely tied up in organic matters, but it helps us to see that. Likewise, with phosphorus, uh, you know, this example, 886 pounds, uh, or excuse me, 886 parts per million, but as you take it at the percent P205, you get up to 2,000. Well, why are we adding it? We don't know how, if that's available. We don't know if that's part of our organic matter fraction, but it, it just helps you to see, like, but if you do see, you start coupling this test with maybe a soil health assessment, you see that I've maintained that high, high level in a total nutrient digest. My soil test, normal soil test, is starting to slip down and maybe into more responsive range. Well, I know I've got a, a high total. I know my, I'm in a responsive range. Is there something, this is where now we start to think about, is there one of these enhancing our project products? Is there a biological now that I can apply to help make that soil pool available? And now I can take the cost I've spent on the fertilizer, I shift it over to this other thing, maybe save uh, a couple of dollars, and but now I'm able to use what I've already got in my soil bank. So those are the kind of kind of things we want to think about. Then the next slide, should be all, they're all popping up in vision. Okay, so then we want to think about soil carbon, and, and this is why, you know, these groups in the room and, and what the, the talk of the last, uh, I'd say four or five years about carbon, uh, carbon storage, it's not, you know, someone else is now just finally carrying the baton that, that soil testing labs have heard that Ray's wanted to carry for the past uh, 60 years is that the best way to increase your fertility, the best, best way to increase productivity is to increase soil carbon. This uh, organic matter, which is 40% which is, uh, plus 3 to 45% carbon, is directly connected to this whole wheel of items. So if we want to uh, increase our fertility, we've got to increase organic matter. If we want to increase water storage, we've got to increase organic matter. Uh, if we want to uh, reduce or make water more available, we got to store water in organic matter because it doesn't hold water like a, like a clay particle does. And next slide. So as we go, you know, this is a, a good reminder that 1% organic matter, you know, we have 1,000 pounds of in, 220 pounds roughly of P205, 140 pounds of sulfur, and all the other micronutrients. It's a great resource, but then once again, notice how all these things are in there together. So when we talk about building soil carbon, we've also got to build all these other nutrients. So if, if we're wanting to build carbon, we got to, we got to do the right things to, to create that uh, environment. You know, reducing tillage, having a living group, a plant, plant and cover crop. But unless you continue to, to add uh, new 
nutrients that don't come out of the atmosphere, and so you got to add stuff other than nitrogen. You, you've got to add that to, to be able to continue to build and, and uh, maintain that carbon. Otherwise, if it doesn't have these other minerals associated with it, it will uh, oxidize and, and go right back off, and, and we don't have any long-term storage. So it's a, it's a cautionary tale that as we want to build carbon, we've got to make sure that we maintain uh, focus on, on other nutrients as well. Now, so when we think about soil, uh, our carbon programs, and, and you know, there's just these very immediate benefits. You know, you get a direct payment. Uh, there's a potential new revenue, revenue stream for you. Uh, if you're reducing tillage, oh, sorry, next slide here. So if you're reducing tillage, you know, you've reduced your labor costs. You, you're maybe, if you're raising some stuff, you've been able to reduce some feeding costs. So a lot of immediate benefits. But I think the one long-term uh, return that no one's talking about, and this got brought up in, in, a, in a meeting from a, a feedlot operator nonetheless, but think about in the future of our land values. What will, if, if you can show if you increase your soil carbon, we know that that has affected all these other things, water holding capacity, nutrient storage, overall productivity. How is that land value now going to increase on, on that ground that you own? So say uh, the next generation now has an asset that's worth, uh, you know, maybe two or three times more than the neighbor because you've adopted these carbon practices and you have increased that, uh, that carbon level, you've increased your productivity. Now your land, you, you essentially, you know, if you're into making sure your, your balance, uh, balance sheet looks good, you know, technically you've increased the value of that ground. And uh, if you're able to look to, to transition or, or sell or do something else, uh, you, sh you should be able to use that as a way to ask for a premium for that ground. Likewise, if you're looking to acquire a piece of property, uh, you can say, hey, you haven't been doing any of these things, uh, your, your, your land's not quite as valuable. Now, I understand that in today's environment with outside money, that that's not going to happen, but you know, maybe, maybe there will be a time where some of these things uh, change, change the way uh, land values are our seeing, and, and so on. So I, I like, to, like to finish with, with one of these thoughts most often is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of talks, uh, and, and, and I, I kind of touched on a little bit today about the nutrient uh, removal, nutrient replacement, but if we're, in a, if we're a, strictly a grain row crop farmer and we're just growing corn or just growing soybeans, we take it off and do nothing else. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a system where you're removing something, it's got to be replaced in some form or fashion. You, you've got to replace those nutrients in some way. Uh, you can't just continue to mine, mine the soil. Now, if you have grazing or something else, yeah, maybe that's maybe not, not quite that drastic, but uh, I always want us, want us to, to remember that we've got to replace the nutrients back to the soil. Unless we get everyone from the city bringing, uh, bringing their byproducts back out to the ground, you know, we, we've got to get, we, we remove that, that nutrient in the grain, we remove the beef, we've got to get it back in some, some way. So, concluding remarks here, next slide. Uh, and I think this is, this is starting to become more true, but soil health is a large umbrella and it's become pretty uh, ubiquitous. I mean, it's just, it's just everywhere. And now even to a, a lesser extent, the term regenerative ag, I think you've seen enough corporate uh, folks that, that want to grab onto something that they can set themselves apart or they can make their, their consumer feel better about themselves. They grab onto this terminology and it's somewhat diluted the idea of what it is because now it's just everywhere. Uh, everyone makes it fit exactly what they need it to fit to sell their product and make their consumer feel better. So I, it's a little disappointing, but at the same time, then I think that's gonna be some of the biggest uh, hurdles moving forward is to kind of get people convinced that it is something special because it's so so often played, so often said, that they will not think it's really that, that important or that unique. Uh, farm profitability, I think that comes from a diligent cost management. Uh, there's no magic potion that's going to be able to, uh, to just apply and, and be 
able to, to, to make profit on your ground. And then I think uh, focusing on carbon, you know, I got, it was at the very end of the talk, but it is very critical. I think the, once again, you know, I'm talking about these distant, distant ideas and some of the soil carbon programs, but I really think if you can increase soil carbon, that is one of the bigger things you're going to be able to do to, uh, to build a, a lasting stewardship legacy on the ground that, that you manage today. And the final, final word is that uh, you know, this is something that I share, share often, but uh, now we're, we're, we're less than 30 years away. You know, the, the prediction is to have another 2 million people. Uh, where is all this food going to come from? Uh, so we, we've, got, we've certainly got a challenge ahead of us to where we have to continue to maintain or increase our productivity on a per acre basis. Uh, and, but I think, uh, I, I, I don't think, I know that certainly Nebraska and Kansas and the Central Plains, uh, that, that most of the, that all the farmers are up to that, that challenge. So this time looks like I left about five minutes for questions. If anyone's got a question or a comment, If not, to so. open. Hey. So is there a test for major aggregates are we seeing uh, differences in the test based on management practices? And I would say absolutely. I, I think that we see on, on guys that we know well. So sometimes when we look at the soil results, we can kind of recognize names from conferences. We know some people from historically. We will see that, yes, their, their modified aggregate tests are elevated. Uh, you know, some, some of these guys, they can get uh, above 80% on that uh, Stable aggregate test. Uh, they, they've got some good production. And then, likewise, we see some soil, and this is where you start to couple things together. We see a soil sample that has high sodium, high base saturation sodium. Its water stable aggregate test just falls apart because that sodium does not allow the soils to hold together very well. So, it's very interesting. Yeah, we can definitely tell on management practices that that, that, that is increasing. Yeah. Assessment. And I, I think, uh, in my opinion, I, I would still like the samples to come 
the spring, I think, you know, before planting. Uh, in a drought year like we're having this year, it's going to be a challenge uh, for companies just taking a sample. Ground's hard. Can I get a good accurate depth multiple times? But then the second, if I'm going to apply fertilizer, I'm going to have a whole lot of mineral nitrogen out there that's going to alter my carbon nitrogen dynamics. And I'm not going to get maybe the correct picture of what I, what I traditionally see. So if you do the sample, uh, say this fall or next spring, and you've been in a dry area and you can solve reduced yields, uh, expect to have higher nitrate, uh, maybe some higher ammonium. Don't get discouraged if you have some sort of low CN ratio and the yield is wrong. No, you have a situation where you have plenty of in there, but the plants they have enough water to use it. So that's a great, great question, great comment there, too. They're moving closer to the stage, so maybe one, one more question, or if not, I'll be, I'll be here all day and, and yeah. you know, so. Okay. Ask him the hard questions. You got this mega brainiac out there. All those hard questions. Like, why in the hell I got this soil test back and it says this and this? Why didn't it work for me? The calls you get every day, man. Yeah. So they're laying it on you, which is that's right. Yeah. So if you guys have any hard questions, get them out for day today. Yep, I'll, I'll be around and yeah, any, any kind of fertility uh, questions. Uh, management, what, what I can do, I, but uh, uh, just once again to appreciate the opportunity to talk this morning, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just constantly learning, and it's, it's been exciting, I look forward to the rest of the day and, and tomorrow, thank you.